Good evening, everybody, and welcome to Coffee Chatter. Starting off our day a dollar late and a dollar sh a day late and dollar short. Sorry that today is Wednesday and I'm just doing Tuesday's episode, but we had a busy day yesterday, so I forfeited last night's show onto tonight. In TV news, Dancing with the Stars Pro announces that he is done dancing. Fans of the Russian giant and season 18 winner Max Murkowski will be saddened to know that the win last season will be his only one. He announced yesterday that he is done dancing at the age of 28. Our cold case this week takes us to New Jersey for the mystery of a missing man who, was, who has been only partially solved. On May 23, 1973, Joseph Duongo was reported missing by family members. He was last known to reside on Drake Street in Bound Brook, New Jersey. His whereabouts were unknown until 2011 when his DNA matched that of remains that were found in August of 1984 in Wars Wing of Euster County in New York. His remains were found by an old campground. Police investigators have been trying to trace the last few days of Duago's life. He was last seen around the third week in May of 1973. He was staying with a man with the nickname Bear at a rental bungalow in Branchburg, New Jersey. The area they stayed at was located behind the former Alibi Bar on Route 28. Duago was 25 years old and a former veteran in the Marine Corps. Before he disappeared, he was arrested on May 9, 1973 for malicious damage to property and had an assault and battery charge due to a domestic dispute. At the time he was last seen, he had shoulder-length hair and a beard. Law enforcement has classified Dezago's death as a homicide. They want to find who this man Bear is and who Dezago may have associated with in the last few weeks of his life. There is a $10,000 reward for any information regarding the disappearance and homicide of Joseph Duago. Please call the Somerset County Crime Stoppers tip line at 1-888-577-TIPS, which is 8477, or go online at the website www.888-577tips.org or www.scpo.net and click on either Crime Stoppers or Tips Hotline. Your correspondence can remain confidential. Now on to some movie reviews. A Greater Yes, The Amy Newhouse Story. This movie is highly recommended by me for anyone who is in need of a faith booster movie. It's about a young girl named Amy Newhouse who died in 1998. It is made after a true story. She goes to Africa as a missionary and shortly after returning, a tumor in her brain is detected. She's considered in remission at one point during the movie and sent home, only to return with a milder form of the same cancer a few short weeks later. In her suffering, she finds a deeper faith and a purpose in her life, inspiring others through her struggle and never wavering faith. She also befriends a young girl who also had chemo treatments, but her first round was successful. In the end of the movie, Amy does pass away, but her legacy continues to live on. I highly recommend this movie. It touched me in a deep way and cemented my calling in the journalism news anchoring industry. Tissues are highly needed, however, as the movie is sad in many places. On different ends of the spectrum is another movie I watched just this afternoon called Sinister. Brought forth by the same person that directed and produced Paranormal Activity and The Conjuring, this movie can easily mess with your head and make you question what you know. It's about a crime novelist who bases his novels after real cases and is planning a best-selling hit with this one that follows multiple families that are murdered. And with each family, one child goes missing. By the end of the movie, they discover what the link is between each family murder, and then the curse strikes the writer's family personally, when the mother, father, and son are murdered, and the daughter disappears. But I will tell you right now, the ending is not what you'd expect. Now for a TV show review, Call the Midwife. Call the Midwife is a show on PBS that is currently in its fourth season with no intentions of stopping. 
An easy way to describe it is TLC's A Baby Story meets Downton Abbey. In short, it follows a new midwife around the towns of London, where most babies are born at home during this time. The convent she works under only has an eight-bed office for hospital deliveries, forcing the midwives to deliver most of the town's babies at home. It's based on the best-selling memoirs of the same name. It's a great show that I highly recommend. It's also highly addicting if you're interested in that type of program, as I am. Also, a book review, Missing Mark, by Julie Hazy. This book is, great, is a great book for anyone who likes chiclet, which is fiction books that's main characters are female. In this particular book, the main character is a journalist who goes above and beyond her job and helps to get to the bottom of a mystery. In this particular one, the mystery of a man who disappeared and left his future bride at the altar. His body turns up a few years later, discovered none other than Channel 3's reporter Riley. The groom's mother also ends up dead, staged as a suicide. This book has just the right amount of mystery to keep me guessing as to who did it, and I was actually wrong in my guess. I assumed it was the groom's previous girlfriend, but in reality it was the bride-to-be's mother. She committed the murder because she felt the groom should be with her instead of her daughter. Her previous book, Finding Susan, was also interesting. I look forward to future books from the author, from this author. Reflection Corner. Now remember, these are readings from yesterday since my show is normally on Tuesdays, as are the Saints for yesterday. So don't argue with me that the Saints feast day was yesterday. I'm aware of this. Our first reading comes from the first book of John, verses, chapter 4, verses 7 through 16. Beloved, let us love one another, because love is of God. Everyone who loves is begotten by God and knows God. Whoever is without love does not know God, for God is love. In this way, the love of God was revealed to us. God sent his only Son into the world so that we might have life through him. In this love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his Son as expiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also must love one another. No one has ever seen God, yet if we love one another, God remains in us and his love is brought to perfection in us. This is how we know that we remain in him and he in us, that he has given us of his spirit. Moreover, we have seen and testified that the Father sent his Son as Savior of the world. Whoever acknowledges that Jesus is the Son of God, God remains in him and he in God. We have come to know and to believe in the love God has for us. The responsorial psalm today is one of my favorites. It's Psalm 34, verses 2 through 11. The Lord is the cry of the poor. Blessed be the Lord. I will bless the Lord at all times. With praise ever in my mouth, my soul will glory in the Lord. That the shame 
In my misfortune, I call the Lord heard, and save me from all distress. The Lord hears the cry of the poor. Blessed be the Lord, the angel of the Lord, who encamps with them, delivers all who fear God. Learn to savor how good the Lord is. Happy are those who take refuge in Him. The Lord hears the cry of the poor. Blessed be the Lord. Fear the Lord, you holy ones. Nothing is lacking to those who fear Him. The powerful grow poor and hungry, but those who seek the Lord lack no good thing. The Lord hears the cry of the poor. Blessed be the Lord. And our gospel was from Luke 10, verses 38 to 42. As they continued their journey, he entered a village where a woman whose name was Martha welcomed him. She had a sister named Mary who sat beside the Lord at his feet, listening to him speak. Martha, burdened with much serving, came to him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me by myself to do the serving? <laughs> Tell her to help me. Shut me off. The Lord said to her in reply, Martha, Martha, you are anxious and worried about many things. There is need of only one thing. Mary has chosen the better part, and it will not be taken from her. This gospel gets to everybody. The question is, which one are you? Are you worrisome Martha, or are you the Mary type that sits at the Savior's feet listening to him? We try so hard to be like Mary, but the worries of the world easily convert us to Martha's. Always worrying about the littlest thing, and without knowing it, we're making excuses for ourselves not to be Mary's. For some reason, our humanity likes being the worrisome Martha, like some kind of a comfort zone. But God wants us all to be Mary's. He doesn't like us worried and frazzled. He wants us to take time for him and just simply be who we are in his presence. If we quiet ourselves enough, we can hear the gentle voice saying to come to him. That is why Catholics cherish the gift of adoration so much, because it allows us to leave our Martha lives at the door and be Mary's for a while. But non-Catholics can also take time out of their Martha-filled days to become Mary's. The rest of this week, let's work on being Mary's. Let's take time to simply be with our God, whatever that means to you. Take time to center your day around that God in your life and let him lead. Listen to him call us. Mary has chosen the better part. So must we. Let us go to him and be ourselves. There's also four saints today, or well, yesterday, but you know what I mean. For the sake of the show, it's today. One of them being Martha, which is why today's reading was all about Martha. Martha is the patroness of homemakers and cooks. She was born in Galilee or Judea. Martha was born around the time of Jesus' birth. She was the sister of Mary and Lazarus, whom Jesus raised from the dead. His feast day is also today. We'll learn about him a little bit later. According to the Bible, these three siblings had an especially close relationship with Jesus. They were his personal friends, and he loved them. Jesus visited them at least twice at their home in Bethany, a small village two miles from Jerusalem. Each time Jesus came to visit, it was Martha who prepared the food and waited on everyone. Instead of helping Martha, her sister sat with Jesus and listened to him. 
Martha once spoke with Jesus about it, hoping he would tell Mary to help her. But Jesus did not say anything to Mary. Even though Martha remained focused on household tasks, she loved Jesus and truly believed he was the Son of God. Four days after Lazarus died, Jesus came to Bethany to revive him. As Martha met Jesus, he told her he was the resurrection and the life. He reassured Martha and added, whoever believes in me, even if he dies, will live. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. When Jesus asked her if she believed this, Martha emphatically replied, yes, Lord, I have come to believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, the one who is coming into the world. This comes from John 11, verses 25 to 27. After Jesus died, according to Western legends, Martha went with her sister and brother to the south of France, where they converted many people to Christianity. It is further believed that Martha died in France. Her remains are said to have been found and enshrined there in the 12th century. If this little France story sounds familiar, it's because last week's show we celebrated the feast of St. Mary Magdalene, which is the Mary that we are speaking of in this story. As with Martha, Mary and Lazarus' relationship, the bond between siblings is usually deep and lifelong. Although rivalries often occur early on, brothers and sisters genuinely develop a mutually supportive and nurturing relationship, such as athletes Alvin and Kelvin Harrison. They are an example of siblings who relied on each other and their faith in God to get them through extreme hardships. They lived apart in two different states, their sister was murdered in 1996, and they lacked proper shelter. Determined to be together, the 21-year-old twins lived in a car for about three months. They firmly believed they were held together by their faith in God, and later said, when you're in the regular world, you have luxuries. You sometimes forget about God. We read the entire Bible when we were there. With God's help, the Harrison brothers persevered and their success is an inspiration. At the 2000 Olympic Games in Sydney, Australia, the 26-year-old athletes both won gold medals in track and field. Also today, we have St. William of St. Bra. William was Bishop of St. Bra and was born in St. Alban, France. Only a few details of William's early life are known. He was born around 1180 in the parish of St. Alban in Brittany, France, to a well-known family. William received his religious training from Bishop Jocelyn of St. Bra, who ordained him as both a deacon and a priest. Over time, he impressed others with his devotion to God and his generosity to the needy. Around 1220, he was made Bishop of St. Bra. During the, his tenure, William went out of his way to help the poor spending his own resources and then borrowing from others to feed the hungry. He also practiced austerities such as sleeping on a wooden board instead of a bed. But William was a private humble man who seldom let others see the sacrifices he made for his faith. While Bishop, William clashed with the local Duke, Peter Mauclerc, who was constantly causing problems for the church. Mauclerc wanted to expand his political power at the expense of the clergy. But William forcefully resisted these efforts. So in 1228, Mauclerc banished him from Brittany. William ended up in Poitiers, where he helped the local bishop who was fighting an illness. William returned home in 1230 and died four years later. He was buried at the local cathedral. In 1247, he was canonized. And when his body was exhumed the next year, it was still intact. His relics survived until the 18th century, when they were unfortunately burned during the French Revolution. William remained true to his principles and resisted the Duke of Brittany. His punishment of exile was not unusual for medieval times. Even in recent years, however, some governments have banished their critics to curb their influence. In the former Soviet Union, for instance, communists used this tactic to try to silence dissident Andrei Sakharov, the so-called father of the Soviet hydrogen bomb, Sakharov evolved from a faithful Soviet physicist into a supporter of democracy and human rights. His writings and speeches against nuclear weapons helped him earn the 1975 Nobel Peace Prize. 
Safarov also protested the arrest and trials of other Soviet dissidents and wrote to the U.S. President Jimmy Carter about conditions in the Soviet Union. In 1980, the Soviet government banished Sakharov to the city of Gorky, placing him under house arrest. He was freed in 1986, just three years before he died. Both men are inspiring examples of courage, remaining true to their convictions in spite of the outcome. We also have St. Lupus of Troyes. Lupus was the Bishop of Troyes and was born in Toul, France. Lots of French saints today, did you notice that? Born fewer than 80 years after Christianity became, became legal in the Roman Empire, Lupus of Troyes' commitment to Christ increased throughout his long life. Married to the sister of the great church orator, Hilary, Lupus and his wife separated by mutual consent. After selling his lands and distributing the money among the poor, Lupus embarked on a life of great austerity at the Abbey of Lyons. It was not long before his spiritual gifts were recognized, and he was named Bishop of Troyes at the age of 45. Lupus rejected the luxury that accompanied his high office. In 429, he was named to accompany Germanus on the first of two missions to battle heresy in Britain. Their preaching was accompanied by miracles, temporarily bringing the island nation back to faith. Returning to France, Lupus faced the fearsome armies of Attila the Hun that were overrunning the area. He met with the pagan warrior and managed to convince him to spare the province. Attila took the bishop hostage, but after the Huns were defeated in battle, the people of Troyes accused Lupus of helping Attila escape. The disgraced cleric was forced to live as a hermit in the wilderness. His humility and patience won back the hearts of his flock, and two years later, he returned to office, which he served faithfully until his death at the age of 94. He was remembered as the father of fathers and bishop of bishops, chief of the prelates of Gaul, the rule of morals, the pillar of truth, the friend of God, and the intercessor to him for men. Lupus's efforts to bring about peace with the hated Attila the Hun were misunderstood. In the same vein, Count Hans von Sponeck whose father was executed for his opposition to Hitler during World War II, sacrificed his diplomatic career in the name of peace. In 2000, von Sponeck, who had worked over 30 years with the United Nations and for months at the as the humanitarian coordinator in Iraq, quit his post in protest over what he saw as unfair United Nations sanctions against the people of Iraq. According to von Sponeck, the economic sanctions levied against the Iraqis since their 1990 invasion of Kuwait were unworkable. The sanctions hurt only the poor. The infant death toll rose greatly after the sanctions were imposed. The Iraqi unemployment rate rose to 60% as a result of sanctions. The only people who benefit from the sanctions are prof profiteers and the corrupt leadership of Saddam Hussein. In 2000, von Sponeck won the Coventry Cathedral's Peace Award. Also a saint today, which I forgot, those of you who love to watch the show Golden Girls will be surprised to know that Saint Olaf is actually a saint. Olaf is the patron saint of Norway and was born there as well. Olaf was in his teens when he left his home in Norway to join a fierce band of Viking pirates. He fought battles in England and the Baltics. But while in Normandy, he became attracted to Christianity and was baptized. After eight years of piracy, Olaf returned to Norway in 1015 to inherit his father's land and succeed him as lord. He quickly drove out the Swedes and Danes, seized the other lord's power, and became king of Norway. Despite his violent past, Olaf brought peace and security to Norway. He abolished the old faith and customs requiring the new laws to be executed justly and destroyed pagan temples, replacing them with Christian churches. Intent on unifying his country, he sought missionaries from England to Christianize his people. Despite his good intentions, Olaf frequently resorted to force in his campaign to destroy paganism and impose Christianity on his people. His actions resulted in widespread discontent especially among those lords who did not approve of his changes. In 1029, they rebelled, 
and with the help of Canute, King of England and Denmark, they drove Olaf from Norway. Two years later, he fought valiantly to regain his kingdom, but he died a martyr. Following his death, miracles were reported and his body was enshrined in the site of Nidaros Cathedral in Trondheim, a pilgrimage center. His fame spread as far as England, where more than 40 ancient churches are dedicated in his name. Although Olaf was a military leader, he introduced the peaceful ideals of Christianity to Norway. Likewise, in 1997, another respected military leader, United States General Colin Powell, introduced similar ideals by founding an organization called America's Promise. Powell believes that the lack of traditional support systems hinders many of our youths from growing healthy, confident, and successful. America's Promise challenges national organizations, including corporations, government agencies, and faith-based communities to fulfill one or more of the five promises by providing caring adults, safe places, a healthy start, marketable job skills, opportunities to serve others. People have also banded together at the local level to fulfill all five promises in their communities. To learn how you can get involved, call America's Promise at 703-684-4500 or visit americaspromise.org. Last on our saints list today is Lazarus of Bethany. Lazarus is best known as being a friend of Jesus. It is unknown where he was born. According to the Gospel of John, Lazarus and his sisters Martha, who we also celebrate today, and Mary, who we celebrated last week, lived in Bethany, a few miles from Jerusalem. They were Jesus' close friends and they believed in him. So when Lazarus became ill, Martha and Mary sent word to Jesus, knowing he could help. But Lazarus died before Jesus returned to Bethany. Following custom, the grief-stricken sisters wrapped Lazarus' body in linen and buried him in a cave tomb. When Jesus finally arrived, Martha met him and he told her that Lazarus would indeed rise from the grave. Mary and other mourners soon arrived. They realized Jesus' power and believed Lazarus would not have died if Jesus had been there. But they would soon see that Jesus' power was even greater than they had imagined. After they arrived at the tomb, Jesus asked the stone in front of the tomb to be taken away. Then he prayed to God and cried, Lazarus, come out. John 11:43. Moments later, Lazarus walked out, wrapped in his burial clothes. Word of the miracle quickly spread and the authorities grew even more threatened by Jesus' power. According to tradition, Lazarus and his sisters drifted in a boat to Cyprus, where Lazarus became bishop. Another legend says that the boat landed in Gaul and Lazarus became bishop of Marseilles, where he converted many. Although Lazarus has been removed from the Roman martyrology, his story reminds us of Jesus' promise of eternal life for all who believe in him. Lazarus was granted a second chance at life by the grace of Jesus' miracle. Today, Lazarus House Ministries, started by Brother Tom Petit in Lawrence, Massachusetts, provides local people with second chances as often as possible. While Brother Petit worked with Mother Teresa in Calcutta, she suggested that he help the impoverished where he, when he returned home. So, in 1983, he opened a homeless shelter in the poorest area of New England, and it expanded to Lazarus House Ministries, which offers such services as a shelter that provides temporary safe housing to families and individuals, a food pantry, soup kitchen, as well as a soup truck, a free dental and medical clinic for uninsured people, and a preschool and adult learning centers. Lazarus House aims to strengthen the family unit so that people receive the support they need to move beyond poverty and back into mainstream living. If you wish to help Lazarus House give, a, give people a second chance, go to LazarusHouse.org or call 978-689-8575. O Almighty God, kindle our hearts with the fire of peace. Let us be aware of the sufferings of others. I pray that all of us do what we can to bring peace and harmony to the world. I pray that we always keep those who are suffering in our hearts and on our minds. Amen.
This week's fan of the week is once again Skylar Charland, who although is recovering from a dangerous spider bite, still could not pass off a chance at being fan of the week. This week's correct answer was Geraldine Fiaro. The next question will be posted later tonight and will feature a new category. Skylar is also one point ahead of my sister for getting fan of season two. Season three will start at the cast announcement for the new season of Dancing with the Stars, which will happen sometime in August. I will see you next week.